everybody, and welcome to our podcast style table talk class. My name is Joni Rampola. I'm one of the registered licensed dietitians for the Giant Company and host of Table Talk. This month, the month of July, we are focused on heart health, and today's topic is eating for a healthy heart. I have two of the Giant Company's experts with us, and I'm thrilled to have them, our dietitian and our pharmacist. I'm going to take time to let you each introduce yourself, and I'm going to start with you, Mary, and then Carolyn will come to you right after. I'm going to introduce yourself. Sounds great. Thanks, Joni. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Robinson. I'm a registered dietitian with the Giant Company, um, and I am in the greater Philadelphia area. And then Carolyn? Hi, I'm Carolyn. I'm a pharmacist with the Martins Company. Um, I work across three different states, Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia. It's like the tri-state area, but my main focus can find me some other places. So So I travel a little bit. bit. (laughs) Oh, sorry. (laughs) My VPN is doing something funky. Yeah, so just for clarity for everybody, we are giant food stores mostly in Pennsylvania and Martin's Food Markets mostly in Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. So thank you both for being here. When we think about eating for heart health, what nutrients are we thinking about like when we're selecting foods? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's start there. Great place to start. Thank you, Joni. So I like to break it down to uh, three big nutrients. There's a lot of different things that we could, a lot of different directions we could talk about, but three big nutrients, um, all beginning with the letter S, so you can help to remember it a little bit, but saturated fat, that's right there. Um, Saturated fat is something that we do want to limit um, as it can raise our LDL cholesterol and increase our risk for heart disease. That's going to be found in things like high fat meat, sausage, bacon. Um, We really want to aim for no more than 30 13 grams per day or five to 6% of your calories. Uh, Aside from that, which doesn't start with the letter S, but another thing we should limit is trans fat. So that's usually found in the same place on the food label. Um, You'll find them right next to each other, but we definitely want to have little to none trans fat as possible. The other two S nutrients that I want to mention are sodium. So sodium, of course, can increase our blood pressure. This is going to be found in a lot of processed foods, some other sneaky sources, which I'm sure we'll mention as we're going through, but um, things like uh, canned soup, cold cuts, pizza, bread, pasta, some condiments. And then the other S is going to be added sugar. So we do really want to reduce our added sugar as well as that can um, Um, provide inflammation and increase your risk for heart disease as well. That's going to be in a lot of beverages. That's actually the top source of added sugar beverages, candies, sweets, um, and lots of other foods too. And so those are the big, big three, big three S's. If you remember nothing else, as far as nutrients, saturated fat, sodium, and added sugar. And those are things that we should limit or cut down in our choices. So are they limited naturally in some diet plans out there? Like is there specific diets for heart health that might be better? Great questions. You may have heard before from maybe a physician or a doctor or maybe a dietitian at some point, but the DASH diet is a very common one that I think is recommended for heart health. And all that stands for, it's an acronym, acronym standing for Dietary Approaches Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And it really focuses on things like whole grains, fruits and vegetables, very much unprocessed food. So um, if you have been around for a while, you have heard us talk about my plate. Um, And so it does really focus on those sorts of food grade food groups and balance, um, and then also limiting sodium as well to under uh, 2,300 milligrams of sodium at at the very least, if not less. But um, that's a good one to look into if you're looking into a specific diet recommendation for heart disease. And how does the Mediterranean diet fit in there? So as I was thinking about that, I was reminded of how similar the Mediterranean diet is to the DASH diet. So that's another idea as well. So the Mediterranean diet certainly does support heart health as well. Um, And it's very similar, I think, to the concepts of the DASH diet. Yeah, they're very similar. Just the fat is different. Mediterranean diet has a little bit more fat and also has more dairy. Um, Yeah, but they're, to me, they're both good for heart health. So you talked about things that we should limit, right? Like the sodium, saturated fat and sugar. But I know a lot of people don't like the thought of removing things from food and focusing on that. What if we wanted to just add something to our diet? Is there something that can make our heart healthier by just adding more? Yeah, I love that. I love that approach, right? 
thinking about it from what can I have versus what can't I have, right? So fruits and vegetables, of course, have a variety of vitamins and minerals. They also have a key component of fiber. So fiber is going to be something that's beneficial for our hearts and also beneficial for many other things within our body. Um, and fruits and vegetables have a lot of fiber in them naturally. Um, another thing, of course, that you can get fiber from would be whole grains. So we do recommend choosing whole grains when those are available. And these are going to be uh, found in things like quinoa or oatmeal or whole wheat pasta, whole wheat bread, um, things like that. Uh, the other nutrient too are omega-3 fatty acids. So those are the, the good fats, if you have heard them termed good versus bad fats, but they are more beneficial for our hearts. And these are going to be found in things such as fatty fish, like salmon. You can find them in nuts, in oils, in avocados, lots of different nutrients or lots of different foods that provide those nutrients. I love that. And to me, that's a great thing to do. Focus on adding more, like you said, whole grains or fiber or omega-3 fatty acids. And that kind of reminds me a little bit about guiding stars because foods in the store earn stars, one good, two, better, three best, if they have some of those same nutrients. So how does guiding stars relate to heart health? Yeah, thanks for that little brief synopsis. But if you're unfamiliar, as Joni mentioned, Guiding Stars is our new nutrition navigation system in our Martins and our giant stores. You'll see them, you'll see the stars, which as she mentioned, one, two or three stars, our products are rated on. You'll find it either on our own brand packaging, you'll see it on the shelf tag, or you can find it if you use Giant or Martin's Direct, you can find it actually like right next to the Nutrition Facts label on a product. But so Guiding Stars is rated on things that are very similar to heart health as well. So foods earn stars if they have things, uh, if they have more fiber or whole grains or omega-3s, which are the three things that we just kind of talked about increasing in our diet. And they um, take into consideration foods that have less saturated and trans fat and also added sugars. So guiding stars can be a really, really helpful tool when you're in our stores and when you're shopping to help you to make the most nutritious choice for your health. I love that because guiding stars also came up last month in our diabetes series for that reduced added sugar. So yes, it's definitely something to pay attention to in a category of food to find better options to nourish you and and help you on your journey. That's great. Carolyn, let's get you in this conversation. So I know here a lot of customers talk about taking a daily low dose aspirin. What are your thoughts on that for heart health? Yeah, so aspirin has actually kind of become a controversial subject in the pharmacy world in the last few years. It, it kind of used to seem like everybody over a certain age should take aspirin daily. And when we say low dose, we mean the 81 milligrams daily. Um, but they've kind of backtracked on those recommendations. The most recent update was in April of 2022 from the United States uh, Preventative Services Task Force. Um, and they came out basically saying for primary for prevention of um, like a heart attack or a stroke, which means if you've never had one before, basically they just say it's not a recommendation, that you should not be taking it unless you're between the ages of 40 and 59 with no bleeding risk and you've talked to your physician about it. Um, Cause maybe you're somebody, sorry about my dogs. Maybe if you're somebody who is at a higher risk from like a family history or something like that, it might be beneficial for you, but I really wouldn't start taking it without at least talking to your doctor about it. First. Now, if, when it comes to secondary prevention, we have, and, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they're triggering everyone else's dogs. Um, so secondary prevention, meaning you have had an event before, so a heart attack or a stroke or something like that, um, they do still recommend a low-dose aspirin. I just would not start taking one until you've talked to your doctor about it. I'm sorry, my dog's freaking out now after hearing her dog bark. <laughs> she's trying to wait and see if she's settled, but she's not. So we're just going to go on. Um, thank you for that, Carolyn. So, so Val is asking, is it a bad idea to use, to use it? Wait, let me go back to that question. Sorry. Negative side effects if you have not had a heart attack. 
The biggest side effect we worry about with taking an aspirin is it increases your bleeding risk, um, particularly in the like in the GI tract, which is a dangerous place to have a bleed. Um, so if you're not taking any other medications that can also increase bleeding risk, which there are some out there, so you need to be careful. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world, especially if you're taking it with some food at the same time to kind of help buffer that in your stomach, then it's not as bad. Um, and you can always watch for the signs of bleeding as well. So if you're getting bruises that you can't explain um, or colors when you go to the bathroom that aren't usually there. So like browns, dark browns and blacks or reds, those are concerns. Um, so really it's just bleeding risk is the huge side effect that we're worried about um, with, with patients taking an aspirin daily. And I have a, another comment. Um, but someone says they're surprised to see how much sodium is in canned food. After her husband had a heart attack, she cleaned out her pantry and gave away bags of food due to the sodium. Yep, that, that is true. So yeah. Carolyn, I wanna pick your brain a little bit more. I think it's common knowledge that smoking leads to heart issues. If someone wanted to reduce or, or stop smoking, are there tools that we can have in the store to help them? Absolutely. Um, I highly encourage anybody who's currently smoking to try to set a goal to quit. Um, you don't have to quit today. Um, but I would definitely start thinking about it, talk to your doctor about it, or talk to your pharmacist about it. Um, our stores carry a range of nicotine replacement products, which are really, really helpful when it comes to curbing the cravings to help you quit. Um, a lot of people do quit cold turkey, but I do think these replacement products make you more successful. And it's important to keep in mind that a lot of people have to keep trying. So you might try to quit and fail and it's really important that you try again. Um, it, a lot of people have to try multiple times before they're actually successful at quitting smoking entirely. Um, now, so in the store, you're welcome to talk to a pharmacist and we have products there that we can go through with you. Um, if you don't wanna to come to the store or you don't have time, there's the 1-800-QUIT-NOW number um, that can help you. A lot of the replacement products are actually covered by insurance. So if you can get your doctor to write prescriptions for them, they might not cost you anything, which is awesome. But I do really encourage anybody who currently smokes to think about quitting because um, one third of all deaths are from heart disease are smoked to link or sorry, are linked to smoking. And within just one year of quitting, you can cut that risk in half. And then within five to 10 years, you cut your risk of various cancers in half. And then after 15 years, your risk of coronary heart disease, it's the same as a non-smoker. So quitting now is honestly really beneficial. It, there's never a moment where it's too late to actually think about quitting and to try to set that goal and, and go for it. And I agree with you and that's great. And I have a customer question. How long after quitting smoking are you completely past nicotine issues? I think that's gonna depend on the individual person. It really depends on how much you're smoking on a regular basis. Um, if you're doing like, you know, two packs a day versus half a pack a day, your dependency is gonna vary. It's also gonna depend a lot on your willpower. Um, but a lot of people, let's say you started with like the nicotine patches. Um, it's a technically like a three-step drop. So you would start at 21 milligrams and when you would stay on that for about a week. If you need another week, you can, or you would drop down to the 14 milligrams for another week, and then you drop down to the seven milligrams for another week. So potentially you could quit within three weeks. Um, now, a lot of people that would probably be difficult, or that sounds like a really lofty goal. You can definitely go slower, like go at whatever pace is going to work best for you, because we ultimately want you to be successful. So if you need to do it slower, then definitely just do it do it slower. Take it at the pace that's going to work for you. Great. Thank you. Hopefully that answered your question and that's great advice. So now I want to go back to medications. Um, how do you support customers who forget or refuse to take medications? Because I feel like that's a common issue. Yeah, that's definitely a common issue. It's probably the issue we fight the most within pharmacies. Um, with trying to get people to take their medicines on a regular basis. 
Um, and the most important thing we start with is reminding you how important it is to take these medications. Um, it's estimated that three fourths of Americans don't take their medicines as they're directed to. And this can lead to severe health consequences. So it, like, for example, uncontrolled blood pressure that could result in heart disease, stroke and kidney failure. Um, so it, it's estimated that over 100,000 Americans die each year just due to poor medication adherence. This also can lead to increased healthcare spending because there's more doctor visits, more emergency room visits and more hospitalizations from this. So a lot of reasons that we don't take our medicines is we might forget, which there are tools for helping you remember. Um, you can try to make it a part of your routine. You can get a pill box to help keep track of your medicines each week. Um, sometimes if you have too many medicines, it's easier to forget to take something. So that's when pill boxes are really, really helpful or even setting reminders on your phone. I used to set reminders all the time for my medicines because I just couldn't remember to take them when I'm really busy at work or something like that. Um, some people don't take them because they're not convinced that it's working or that they need it. Um, so in those cases, we just really need to go back and educate and see why you think it's not working because some medicines you're not going to really feel that it's working for you um like your blood pressure you're not always going to feel if it's high or if it's starting to dip lower so a lot of the times people will think well i don't need the medicine because i feel fine well you still need the medicine because your blood pressure might still be too high or too low and we don't want to you know risk causing any more severe problems from leave, leaving that untreated uh, fear of side effects is another huge issue, um, which if you ever think that you're experiencing a side effect from a medicine, please talk to your pharmacist or doctor, because um, there's usually another drug in the same kind of class or another drug outside of that class, but that's also used to treat whatever we're trying to treat, and we can always try to switch things up for whatever is going to work best for you. Um, sometimes it's difficulty taking a medicine that will prevent us from taking something. For example, there are some inhalers that are a bit tricky to use. Um, some people will have to do injections, which can be tricky if you're not good with fine motor skills. Uh, even being a, a pill too small with fine motor skills, that can be an issue. Or if a pill is too large, trying to swallow it is an issue. So if you ever have problems like that, also just talk to your pharmacist. We'll definitely work with you to figure something out that works well for you. And then perhaps a big, the customer oh, commented also due to finances. That, yep, that was the one I was about to hit. The biggest thing is probably finances. The cost is too high for a medicine. Um, so I would certainly talk to your pharmacist or even your insurance company if a medicine is too high in cost to find an alternative. A lot of the times it's just there's another drug in the same class that's not on your insurance company's formulary. And we can try to work together to figure out which medicine is going to work best that's gonna be cheapest for you. So as long as you're open and communicating with your pharmacist or your doctor, we can try to figure out problems to get around these medication issues. Great, thank you. Now I'm gonna go back to Mary. Mary, can you talk us through some strategies to reduce saturated fat in the diet and and just give us a refresher as to total fat versus saturated fat. Yes, absolutely. So the nutrition facts label does break this down and I do have a visual. I've got a couple visuals here uh, and I think we have some time. So let's go ahead and dive into that then. So um, I'm sure at this, by this point, hopefully most of you have at least seen a nutrition facts label, but if not, you can find it on your packaging. But okay, so as you can see, we've got total fat right here. And that's going to be the total amount of fat in the product, right? But, but right below that is going to be saturated fat and trans fat, which I talked about a little bit earlier, which these are the things that we do want to limit in our diet, right? Um, another great visual from the American Heart Association that I wanted to also show you um, is this great little kind of like a, a green, yellow, red light system. Um, and heart.org is the American Heart Association's, Association's website and it has a lot of information, really credible research-based um, information. So anything that we talked about nutrition-wise or other things too, right? This is a really great resource to check out if you have any further questions. But anyway, so this gives a great visual of the types of fats, the different types of fats, and how we should include them in our diets and some great visuals as well for types of foods, right? So the saturated fat, um, which we're focusing on, 
we do really want to limit that in our diet. And then this, uh, what does it say? Lose it. Yes, lose it. Um, sorry, my uh, the just the image was uh, blocking it. Anyways, lose it. This really is for the trans fat category, okay? So trans fat on a label, um, if you don't see it listed on the label, because with labeling, um, they are able to not list trans fat if it's less than 0.5 milligrams on a label. But if you go down to the ingredients list, you want to look for the words that are partially hydrogenated or tropical oils. Okay. So right here, that's what you're looking for in the ingredients list that you, that you don't want to have. Okay. These are the things that we really don't want to have in our diet. And then the saturated fat, again, limiting that, that's going to be found in our butters, bacon, cheese, heavy cream, those high fat dairy products. And then finally, the love it category, these are going to be those omega-3 fatty acids that we talked about, or unsaturated fats found in oils, avocados, salmon, just kind of a little recap here. As far as some strategies, though, to reduce your saturated fat, one of the biggest ones that we talk about is removing the visible fat off of um, meats, cuts of meats. So if you're consuming chicken or consuming steak, right, taking off the white part of those meats can greatly reduce that saturated fat content, especially um, even skin, like if you're uh, consuming poultry or something like that, removing the skin can help to reduce that fat as well. Swapping oil in place of butter can be another easy one. If you're sauteing something and you generally use butter, try using olive oil or some sort of oil to just kind of reduce that saturated fat as well. Uh, the cooking methods, cooking methods is another strategy. So instead of frying your food, grilling or baking, or um, again, sauteing in a little bit of oil versus like a deep fat fry. And then finally to moving towards more of a plant-based um, eating habit as well. So adding more vegetables, even if it's just simply, you know, incorporating more veggies in a stir fry and a little less meat or something like that, um, or choosing plant-based proteins such as beans or nuts or legumes, something like that. Those are some great um, kind of practical strategies that you all hopefully can implement in your lifestyle. Yep. And I love that you can just add and have improvement in your diet. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Got a customer question. Why is coconut oil bad? Great question. So coconut oil is kind of controversial a little bit, although I feel like it's less popular than it was. Um, but is it is actually a saturated fat. So it has saturated fats within it. It is solid at room temperature. Um, that's kind of a, a good way to know if a fat is saturated or unsaturated. So because it is solid at room temperature, it does have those saturated fats. Um, so that's where it's a little bit less helpful for our hearts, right? Whereas something like an olive oil is definitely going to be the way to go there. Now, if you're using it like you were using butter, that, then that, that would be fine. But we don't want to be using too, too much of it as far as um, it, it is still an oil. It's still a fat. Yeah. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> Good. Can you share some strategies to reduce sodium? Yeah. Let's talk about sodium a little bit. So um, as one of the customers mentioned, canned goods is one of those sources of sodium. So one strategy right off the bat is to choose no salt added or low sodium canned goods when we're looking at any sort of canned goods. Um, and to, to read the nutrition facts labels, I think that's a really good way to find what would be a lower sodium option. Um, I mentioned some higher sodium foods earlier on, but uh, just a refresher, some of the biggest culprits for sodium include bread, uh, lunch meats, deli meats, canned soup, sauces like pasta sauces or any sort of jarred sauce, condiments can be another one like ketchup or salad dressings. Um, and then of course, canned veggies, we kind of talked about that. And then any sort of convenience food as well. So frozen items that you might grab, there's some sort there's processing that goes in there and there's going to be additional sodium for uh, preservative me measures. And then also of course for taste. So looking for low sodium products can be really helpful when you're cooking at home, trying to not cook with the salt, salt shaker and use different herbs and spices to season your foods. Um, one, one sometimes surprising thing that I'll talk to individuals about is that garlic and onion salts, they have sodium. So if you use those a lot in your cooking, by default, you're going to be adding some salt to your food. So even swapping those for a garlic powder or onion powder. Um, and then finally, you know, again, just kind of reading the nutrition facts label. That's what it comes down to with the sodium, um, 
thought. So again, just like with, as I showed you with the uh, fats, the sodium is also just a little bit below on the Nutrition Facts label. All right, I have a, a, quite a few customer questions. So I'm gonna roll through them now. How about coconut canned milk? Where does that fit? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I personally have not used it that much, but I do believe it is sweetened. So certainly check out the nutrition facts label on there. I, I think it's, it's sweetened. So the added sugar would be the problem there. As far as um, its fat content, I would imagine that it is in, it does have some saturated fat within it because I do believe that um, it's used as like a heavy whipping cream replacement in a lot of recipes. So it's going to probably have some saturated fat and it's going to have some added sugar. Joni, have you ever cooked with it before? Can you? Yeah. So this? they do have a full fat version that does have sugar in it as well. So it has, you know, sugar and fat added that are not the best for your heart health, but you can get unsweetened and a lower fat. So that would probably be a better choice. Okay, comment. My girlfriend has allergic reactions to many, many medications, often winding up in a hospital emergency room. She's 79 years old. Can a person get two to three days of medications instead of a full prescription? Yeah, definitely. Um, if you, you basically can get any amount on a prescription that you want, um, you just have to ask for it as long as it's up to the amount that the doctor wrote for. So if your doctor wrote for 30 pills, you can get one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to 30. You just need to let the pharmacy know so that we can bill it properly and count out the right number of tablets that you want. So just as long as you talk to the pharmacy, we can do that for you. Oh, interesting. Didn't know that. <laughs> um, Peggy, I don't know, you might need to clarify this, but here's a question. Should fat and skin be removed before cooking? In terms of saturated fat, I think that's gonna certainly help. Um, it's gonna reduce that fat. Oh, of meat, yes, okay. My mind went to vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> fat and skin, yeah, got it. That makes sense now, thank you. Then you can get the rest of the pills later if there are not issues, or do you need another prescription? As long as it's not um, the most controlled type of controlled substance, yes. If it's what's called a C2, um, which are generally your opioid pain medications, um, we can't really divvy those out. You'd have to get the full amount or you would lose the rest essentially. Um, but for your regular medicines, like your blood pressures, cholesterol, lowering stuff, antibiotics, things like that. Yeah, you, you can get a small amount and then come back and get the rest at, an, at another date. That's perfectly fine. All right, we have two minutes left. And Mary, I'm just going to ask you to go through some surprising sources of added sugar. Sure. So added sugar, we want to have no more for women, six, no more than six teaspoons per day. For men, no more than nine teaspoons per day. In grams, it's going to be about 25 grams for women. Um, for men, 36 grams of women or uh, six, 36 grams of sugar, added sugar per day for men. Um, but yes, yeah, some, some surprising sources of added sugar. One of the most surprising, I think is salad dressings, right? Cause they're not sweet. You don't, you don't expect them to have added sugar, but definitely some of those are going to have some added sugar, ketchup, sports drinks, beverages, of course, soda, right? We all think that, but sports drinks, right? You might be thinking, oh, this is going to be hydrating myself after something, but there can be a lot of added sugar in there. Baked beans, pasta sauce. I know I mentioned that for sodium. There's also added sugar in there as well. And it's not even sweet. So very surprising. Yogurt, of course, sweetened yogurt. That's going to have a lot of added sugar. I think I looked at my, I have a vanilla Greek yogurt and I looked at it this morning and I want to say it said 14 grams of added sugar. I was feeding it to my one-year-old. So I was like, oh, how much is in this? And then I looked at it and I was like, oh my goodness, that's a lot, especially for a one-year-old. Instant oatmeal, that's another big one. So those sweetened oatmeal packets that are super convenient. Yes, there's whole grains, but there's gonna be a lot of added sugar. And then finally dried fruit, because sometimes dried fruit, although it's a fruit, right? There's gonna be added sweeteners to that as well. So sometimes. Yeah. Just to kind of add on to that, a lot of over-the-counter medicines also have a lot of hidden sugars. So a lot of those liquid cough syrups, they have a lot of sugar in them. So just be aware of that. I would, there are usually next to them sugar-free versions. So you might want to look, steer towards those instead of the regular ones. Yep, and food dye in them. It gets me mad. <laughs> so is plain instant oatmeal okay? I would recommend to 
lean more towards that. Although sometimes the sodium's high with instant oatmeal. It's not generally like, it's not, not, not high, high, but like an average instant oatmeal packet can have upwards to like 110 milligrams of sodium. So I would recommend making it from yourself, purchasing like a instant oats or old fashioned oats, right? Either one. And then adding your own flavorings. You said instant, but I think you mean quick oats. That's what I meant. Thank you, Shijoni. Yes. Yep. Just buy the canister of quick oats and usually it can get done really quickly with just hot boiling water added in one minute or microwaving it. Perfect. Well, we are just about at 1230. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Great questions. You can add fruit to your oatmeal, right? Overnight oatmeal is easy to make and good. Yep. We love all the ideas. So thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And hope you'll stay tuned next week when we dive more into building your plate. Got a lot of thank yous coming in and people appreciated the questions. Great. Thank you.